when I was in high school, my senior, senior year of high school, my, my aunt, my high school principal, sent me uh, to Dallas, Texas to take some testing called the Ames testing to tell you what you're to be and things that you can do when you grow up and you do all kinds of two or three days worth of testing and they send you through a battery of, of stuff. And at the end of the time, they sit down and they say, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. And so at my time there at the end, the man who, who did all the testing sat there with my mom and, I, and my dad and he said, uh, when, based on your personality and, and the things through this testing, he said, what, what you uh, don't ever need to do in your life is to be a farmer. Um, and I thought, okay. It hurt my heart because if I can just be honest with you, there's a part of me that always kind of thought farming would be a fun thing to do. I was in Marmaduke for three years where they grow rice and everything, and I thought farming would be something that would be enjoyable. I uh, worked in the dirt, being outside. My wife's family, uh, they're all farmers in South Georgia, and so I enjoy being around them. And then I began to think, well, what would it be like as a farmer if someone came to you and said, I'm going to give you all the land that you need to farm. All the land that you need, everything that you need in land to farm, you can, you can have. And then, I'm not just going to give you the land. Somebody says, I'm going to give you the tractors that you need and the tools and the equipment that you need in order to do the farming on your land. And I'm not just going to give you the farm land and the farm equipment. I'm going to give you the seeds that you would use to sow in order to be an effective farmer. In other words, what if someone sat down with you as a farmer and said, I'm going to give you everything that you need to be the best farmer that you can be. All you have to do is farm. We come to the text today thinking about that line of thought and what Christ and Peter is writing here in 2 Peter chapter 1 in our spiritual lives. Not so much in farm land and farm seeds and farm equipment, but just in the provisions and the things that we need in order to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. In other words, what you're going to see in the text here is God says, I've given you everything you need. I've given you farm land. I've given you farm equipment. I've given you farm seeds. But now you have a responsibility, and that is to farm in the things that I've provided for you. Let's talk about spiritual maturity this morning. And our walk in our relationship with the Lord as we grow in the knowledge of the Lord. God has given everything we need in order to do that. But you and I have a personal responsibility. Listen, every single one of us, whether we gave our life to the Lord a week ago, yesterday, or 20 years ago, we each bear responsibility in the maturation process of our spiritual faith and our walk with the Lord. You're going to see that in the text this morning. So this is what I want us to do. So I'll walk through there. Let's divide it into three sections, shall we? The first part in verses 3 and 4, I want you to see the provisions for maturity. I want you to see in verses 3 and 4, God saying to you and I in our spiritual life, I have given you everything you need. I've given you everything that you need in order to grow in your faith with the Lord. Notice what he says in verse 3. The first thing in the provisions of maturity, he says, I've provided you power. Verse 3. Peter says, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Now let's stop. He says here in the text, Peter says, God has provided for you and I in this provision power. He says that by, by the divine power that comes in the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So in the moment of salvation, when you and I accept Christ as our personal Savior, when we acknowledge that we're a sinner in need of a Savior, in that moment of conversion, he provides for us divine power that comes through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. So when you knelt down where Wherever you were, you said a prayer, whatever, whatever moment in your life it looked like, in that moment, divine power was placed inside of you, and that divine power comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, God says, I've given you, he says in this verse, everything required for life and godliness that you have and you own in your life, in your relationship with the Lord, inside you in the moment of conversion, at the moment of knowledge of him who called you by his own glory and goodness, he says, I provided for you everything. Everything that you need to grow in your relationship with me. It isn't that, that we don't get it in, in installments. It isn't that we receive Christ and then we go to camp and we get more. We go to revival and we get more. We, 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 we read a book and we get more. We sit in church.
church and we get more. No, in the moment of conversion, at the moment of the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness, you and I receive everything we need in the power of divine gift through the Holy Spirit in our life. So what we have to grow in our faith, listen, is not based on you and your gifts and your abilities. It's not based on your name or your heritage or where you've been or haven't been. You have in that moment everything given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. But not just power and provisions. He says they've given you promises. Verse 4. He says, by these... He's given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. So let's take it in three steps. Go back up. He says this. But by these he has given us very great and precious promises. So with the divine power that's instilled in, instilled in you and I at the moment of conversion, he's given us everything in these great and precious promises. The result of this is that so that through them you and I can share in the divine nature. So we can, be, we, we, we can pursue holiness, we can pursue godliness, we can pursue goodness, we can pursue greatness in the sight of God, not because of who we are, but because of what's been planted inside of us through his divine power so that through those things we can share in the divine nature of God. So you and I, listen, when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, in that moment of conversion, of knowledge, you received everything you need. In other words, you received farmland, you received farm equipment, you received farm seeds, you received everything in that moment, but you and I have a responsibility now to grow in that. So he says, you share in the divine nature, and as a result of that, we escape the corruption that's in the world because of evil evil desire. So you and I can escape the corruption. We can protect ourselves. We can be mindful of the corruption of the world because of these promises and the, and the, the, the power that's been given us at the moment of conversion. Now go quickly through that because I want you to camp out in the next few verses. But notice this quote. He says this, believers should live in a way that pleases God because Christ has given them everything they need for life and godliness. The indicative of God's gift precedes and undergirds the imperative that calls for human exertion. In, in other words, you and I, brothers and sisters, believers in Christ, we ought to, we must live in a way that honors and pleases God because he's given us everything that we need to live for life and godliness. In other words, the, the, indic or the, the gift of God, verse 3, he's given us everything through his divine power. It precedes and undergirds the foundation for you and I to live a life that honors and glorifies God. And, uh, may I say it this way? We have the farm, we have the farmland, we have the seeds, we have everything we need, verses 3 and 4, but we have a responsibility to farm. A farmer doesn't walk out in, in, in July and say, man, I got the best land, I got the best equipment, and I got the greatest seed you can buy. I'm going to go inside my house, I'm going to hang out for a few weeks, for a few months, I'm going to come back in August, and I'm going to, I'm going to reap my corn. I'm going to come back in, in, in September, and I'm going to reap my, my rice, and I'm going to come back in, in November, and I'm going to reap my, my soybean and my cotton. No, there's a responsibility on behalf of the farmer to work and to farm. He has everything he needs, but you have to farm in order to reap a harvest. And Paul, Peter's saying here, you have everything you need. Now it's your job to farm. It's your job to work. It's your job to, to put forth the effort, if you will, in order to reap a harvest. That's why we get to the process of maturity. Now come to the text in verses 5 and 7. Notice what Peter says. In the beginning of verse 5, he says, for this very reason, I encourage you to write in your Bibles, circle for this very reason and draw a line back up to verses 3 and 4. Because you have the divine promises and because you have the divine power that rests inside of you, you and I now have to farm. You and I now have to go to work and put forth an effort. He says in verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort. He says this three times in these verses. He says, make every effort in verse 5, make every effort in verse 10, and make every effort in verse 15. Peter's saying to them, you have everything you need, now it's time to farm. Well, what does it look like? What is the process? He says in verse 5, to supplement your faith with goodness. Now, let's walk through this together, okay? He says, for this reason, because you have everything you need, make every effort to supplement 
your faith, the foundation of your walk with the Lord, supplement your faith with goodness, with goodness, with knowledge. Keep going, Emily. With goodness, knowledge. For um, uh, verse, verse 6, he says, knowledge, you add self-control. Self-control, you add endurance. And endurance, you add godliness. Verse 7. Godliness, you add brotherly affection, and brotherly affection, you add love. Now you read this, you're like, well, how, what does this mean to me in my life? I'm glad you asked. Let's, let's, give us, let's give ourselves a checklist, shall we? In fact, let me encourage you to write this in the margin of your, uh, uh, in, in the back of your Bible, in, in, in maybe your journal or where you are, and just use this as a checklist in your spiritual walk with the Lord. Use this list as a time to pause and ask yourself, may I say, how am I doing farming? He says, and let's just go through the list. He says, add to your faith the foundation. Add to it first. He says, add goodness. Goodness is just being kind. He says, in your, in your walk with the Lord, in your relationship with him, do you just model kindness or just do good? Perhaps here's a question to ask. Who do I need to show kindness to? We've studied over the last few weeks in the responsibility for you and I in Romans chapter 12 to be kind, to be kind to those who are kind to us, to be kind to those who are not kind to us, to don't show evil for evil, but to walk in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. So in your supplementing of your faith, the check mark that you would look for in your life is, is there somebody in my life that I just need to be kind to? Do I exhibit kindness in my home? Do I exhibit kindness in my work? Do I exhibit kindness in in Walmart? Do I exhibit kindness on 67167? Do I exhibit kindness in just my school and in my life? Do I live a kind, good life? Not just goodness, but then to add to that knowledge. Knowledge here is practical wisdom. It's, It's you and I growing in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess the question you would ask yourself at this moment is this. How am I doing in my walk with the Lord? Do you know more about Jesus now than you did two years ago? Do you know more about God now than you did 20 years ago? Are you growing in your knowledge of God? How about your quiet time? Your time alone with Jesus? How how about your journaling time? How about your worship time? How about your knowledge of the Lord? The psalmist says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The question is, am I growing in my walk with the Lord? Do I know more about God now than I did when I bent my knee and and, and entered into a relationship with him? See, if we're not careful, for some of us, we'll go long periods of time and never have a quiet time. We'll come to a place in our life where we'll say, I, I've been going to church for 30 years. There's nothing else I need to know. Uh, I've been going to church for 50 years. I've been going to church for five years. I, I, I've been doing this. I've been doing that. And we're not growing in our knowledge. And we're not supplementing our faith with knowledge. And we're not doing what Peter says. Make every effort to add to goodness, to add knowledge. Third, he says, add to it self-control. This is just a place in our lives where we just remain under control. What's interesting is the guy who's writing this is Peter. If you know much about the New Testament, you know Peter was the leader of the disciples. Peter was the guy who bailed out of the boat. Peter was the guy who swung the sword and took off the ear. Peter was the guy who was speaking the most for the disciples. But Peter says, in my faith and in my walk with the Lord, I am making every effort to exhibit self-control. So I ask you this question. What area of my life, what area of your life are you not in control? Perhaps it's social media. Every moment of every day, you can't figure out enough of what's going on in the social media world, and you're absolutely out of control in your consumption of that. Maybe you're out of control in your anger, and everything sets you off. Everything makes you mad. And so for you and and your walk with the Lord, you need to add to your relationship with him some self-control. And there's some, there's some responsibility in the midst of that. And you need to slow down in the anger and slow down in, 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 in the hurt and slow down in the, in, in the slander of others. And so there's this issue of self-control. And you say, well, David, I can't control this area of my life. And there's a Greek word for that, baloney. He says in verses three and four, he's given you everything you need. 
You have the ability to remain under control. You have the ability to have to add to the knowledge, to exhibit goodness. You have the ability, the next thing he says, to show endurance, to don't quit. What area of your life are you quitting in? What area of your life have you stepped back in? What area of your life have you throwing in the towel, if you will? And you say, David, it's just too hard. I, I can't keep doing this. I, I can't keep walking through this. I can't keep going through this. And I would point you back to verses 3 and 4 where he says, He is giving you everything required for life and godliness. You have the farm. You have the farm equipment. You have the seeds. Farming is tough. And so you don't quit. Regardless of the circumstances, you don't quit. This was a hard lesson at my house growing up. My mom and dad aren't here today. My, my nephew's being baptized. But I was never allowed to quit. When I was in the eighth grade, I joined a group called Mission Singers. And we practiced every Sunday afternoon singing. That's all we did was sing. I signed up for it. The person that I went to my church, we both signed up for it. Their parents let them quit mission singers. My parents didn't let me quit mission singers, and I'm still working through it in my own life now. <laughs> but my dad looked at me, and my dad said this, we don't quit. You start it, you finish it. And Peter's saying to the church here, endurance. Don't quit. You have what you need. Some of you are in the midst of a difficult time in your life right now. Some of you are in the midst of a hard time in your life, and you're ready to throw in the towel. You're ready to walk away. You're ready to quit. You're ready to give up. You're ready to be done with it. And Peter's saying, don't do it. Add to your faith endurance. You have what you need. It's inside of you. It's a power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Not just endurance, but godliness. This is a pursuit for God. This is, a, this is an unquenchable thirst in your heart, in my heart, for the knowledge and the presence and the glory of God in our life. So the question would be, what area of my life is displeasing to God? What area of my life is not honoring to the Lord? What area of my life is not pleasing to Him? Am I not pursuing His glory and His greatness and His, and his power in my own life? Then he says to add to that brotherly affection. It's an interesting word here by Peter. Peter talks about just being generous, just living a life of generosity. So the question would be, who can I minister to? Who's somebody in my life that I can minister to? Who's somebody in my life that I can show love to, that I can care for, that I can reach out to, that I can help meet a need in their life? And then Paul says, add, Peter says to add to it love. Love for God. And the question would be this, does God have my heart? So step back, church. Just step back. And allow this to be a checklist. Write it in your Bible. Write it in your journal. Every morning, wake up and ask yourself, am I growing in goodness? Am I increasing in my knowledge? Am I remaining self-control? Am I, am I willing to, to not quit? Is there, is there a pursuit in my life for the godliness that pleases God? Am I, is there somebody in my life that I need to love? Or somebody in my life that I need to be generous to? Or somebody in my life that I need to care for? Is there any way in my life and in my heart that I don't love God with everything I have? Peter says, you have what you need. You have the power and you have the provisions inside of you in, in, in your life. At the moment of conversion, now your job is to farm. Your job is to supplement. Your job is to add to these things in your pursuit of the Lord. So, well, what if I don't do that? What, what if I don't want to add goodness and knowledge and self-control and endurance and godliness and brotherly love and brotherly affection and love? Peter addresses that in the very next section, doesn't he? Go to verse 8. He gives a warning and then he gives two encouragements. But let's start in verse 9, shall we? And let's do the warning first. Notice what he says. Verse 9. The person who lacks these things. Stay with me, church. He says, the person who lacks goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. The person who lacks these things are, is three things. First, they're blind. They're short-sighted and they're forgetful that they're cleansing from past sins. 
Peter says, if, if you lack in these things, if you are deficient, if you will, in these things, Peter says, here's what's going to happen. You're, you're, you're blind. And in relationships, in your marriage, with your children, at school, in, in the community, in life, you'll be blind. And someone will do something to you, and, and you'll respond. Difficult situations will come, and you want to throw in the towel and quit. There'll be hard times in your life. There'll be something that'll come into your heart and in your life that isn't pleasing to the Lord. And instead of getting rid of it and pursuing godliness, we become comfortable with it, and we allow it to stay there. And Peter, Peter says, the, the result of you lacking these things is you become blind and you become short-sighted. And you forget that there was a moment that you were cleansed from the sins in your life. You'll forget 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you'll forget that before you gave your life to Jesus, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You, you will be short-sighted and blind and forget that there was a time in my life where nothing about me was pleasing to the Lord. That there was a time in my life where I was dead in my trespasses and sin. But thanks be to God, through his grace and his mercy, he restored me to a right relationship with him. And Peter says, if you don't add to these in your faith, if you don't work and diligently farm, then this is what happens. You're blind. You're short-sighted, and you're forgetful. So wh what about you and your life where you are now? Would, would this describe your, where you are spiritually? Would, would these be words that describe your walk with Christ? Would these be words that describe your relationship with your husband or your wife? Would these be words that would describe you in just your day-to-day -day life? Peter says, if you lack these things, if you don't add to your faith these things, this is what becomes of you. But, Peter says, let me give you a word of encouragement. Verse 8, go to verse 8. He says this, for if you possess these qualities, if you possess goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection and love, if you possess these things and, in, and you grow in them, you increase in them, then they will keep you from being useless and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now feel the weight of this, church. So feel the weight of this. P Peter says, if, if you allow these things to increase in your life, if you allow these things to become checklists where daily you're pursuing goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love, <coughs> then Peter says the result of that is that you will be useful and fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that, that we will become useful in kingdom work. We become useful in church. We become useful in life. We become useful in the areas of our life. Paul says if you increase in these things, then you become useful in kingdom work. The sad part about it is, church, you, you know it to be true. When we don't grow in these areas, when we don't put forth the effort, listen, listen to my heart, hear my heart. When we don't work, when we don't do what Peter says, make every effort, then we shrink back in our kingdom effectiveness. We, we step back. And God says, I want to use you in, a, in, in kingdom work. I want to use you in student ministry, children's ministry, choir ministry, uh, 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 Sunday school ministry, parking lot ministry, whatever. I want to use you in kingdom work. I want you to be used and effective and fruitful in kingdom work. But, but, but God says, I can't do that because you're not making any effort to grow in your goodness, your knowledge, your self-control, your endurance, your godliness, your brotherly love, or your brotherly affection, and your love. You've seen it happen in your life, and I've seen it happen in my own life. That God's knocking on your heart. God's knocking on your heart right now. For some of you, the Holy Spirit has just come upon you in these moments. And he's saying to you in your hallways of your heart, not me, but the Word of God and the Spirit is saying to you, I want to use you. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to be effective. I, I want you to be used in kingdom work. And you're going to have to farm. You're going to have to add. You're going to have to make every effort. And Paul says, Peter, sorry, in verse 10, he says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, second time, make every effort to confirm your calling and your election. In other words, this is what he's saying. 
you make every effort. That everything inside of you becomes a pursuit. That, that, you, that you validate your, your, your calling and your, your election. That you, you validate the, the salvation experience in your life. That you, you confirm it. There's no doubt. There's no wondering. There's no, did this really happen? But the more you pursue these things, the more they validate God's calling on your life and the salvation that you have experienced in your life. And he says, if you do these things, if you do these seven things that he mentioned, then you will never stumble. And that doesn't mean that we're never going to fall. That doesn't mean we're ever going to, 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 to not mess up. We mess up every day of our lives. I mess up every single day of my life. But Peter says, if, if you pursue these things, then, you, then you're not going to lay there on the ground and become useful. And lay there on the ground and become ineffective. It's true, church, isn't it? You know it to be true. If you make every effort, if you pursue these things in your life, godness and knowledge, if you, if you say to, to, to every morning when you wake up in and, and quiet times and in and, and devotional times and in daily lives, you say, I want to add to these in your relationships and life. But not just here. Paul says, there'll come a moment when you stand, he says in verse 11, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of the Lord our Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. In other words, Peter says, you pursue these things. You make every effort to allow these things to become part of your life. And you won't stumble here temporarily. But when you stand in front of the Lord, when you stand in front of Jesus and enter into the kingdom, he says it will be richly provided for you. <clears throat> My aunt that I mentioned earlier was... Um, my Aunt Karen, my mom's sister. She was my high school principal. And I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. It's not a whole lot of fun for your aunt to be your high school principal. My mom and dad knew stuff about me doing stuff before I knew about me doing stuff. <laughs> but my aunt, never married, never had kids. From grade school to doctoral work. She was the go-to person for me for tests and quizzes and papers. We had a saying with my aunt. She would call it homework prison. And she would make me sit and she would make me finish my homework. And I knew when I gave her a paper that I was to submit that I would receive it back and it would be bled all over. She's an English teacher and she would just rip it to shreds. And I'd have to go back in and rework it and rewrite it. And there were times in my life where I didn't want to call her because I knew if I called her, it was going to be tough. It was going to be difficult. It was going to be a hard test. It was going to be studying. It was going to be late nights. It was going to be note cards. It was going to be, in, it was going to be difficult. But I knew, I knew that if I was going to pass from first grade all the way up, my odds of passing and doing well were increased because of my aunt's love for me and constantly reminding me and challenging me and pushing me. I often think about what, what's my job here as your pastor. Jonathan and I had this conversation Friday, Thursday. I think my job as your pastor, is to prepare you for the day when you will stand before the Lord. And in that moment, as we stand and we go through these things, it's a reminder of our pursuit of Jesus. In fact, this is what Peter says. Verse 12, Peter says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things. Even though I know that you, are, that you know them and you're established in the truth that you have. In other words, this is what Peter says. Peter says, it is my responsibility to remind you of these things. Listen, church. 
He says, it's my responsibility to remind you of these things. I know you know these things. I know that Brother Steve and Ron and everybody preached on this stuff. I know that you know in your walk with the Lord that you're to add goodness and knowledge and brotherly love and love and endurance. I know that you know that you're not to quit. And I know that you know that when the going gets tough, you don't hang it up. I know that you know that when someone does harm or evil to you, you don't return evil for evil. I, Peter says it. I know it. You know these things, and you are established in these things. But this is what Paul says, verse thir- Peter says in verse 13. But I think it's right. As long as I am in this bodily tent to wake you up with a reminder, verse 14, since I know that I will soon lay aside my tent as our Lord Jesus Christ has indeed made clear to me. John and I were sitting here this Thursday and it came together. I have no idea how long the Lord's gonna let me be your pastor. It could be two more weeks, two more months, two more years, or 20 more years. I don't know. But here's what I do know. That as long as the Lord allows us to minister here, we're going to remind ourselves of these things. We're going to remind ourselves to add to our faith goodness and self-control and knowledge and endurance and brotherly affection and godliness and love. And as long as the Lord allows us to remain here, as the Lord allows us to continue to do ministry, as the Lord allows us to continue to preach and minister here, we're going to continue to remind ourselves of these things. We're, in the words of Peter, it's just right for us to do it. In fact, he says in verse 15, he says this. He says, and I will also make every effort so that you are able to recall these things at any time after my departure. And then you see you're together, right, church? He says, I'm gonna, you, you make every effort to add to your faith these things, and then you make every effort in your walk with the Lord. And Peter says, I'm going to make every effort. As long as I preach, as long as I teach, as long as I minister, I'm going to make every effort to remind ourselves of these things. I'm going to make every effort to remind ourselves that, that you and I are to pursue these things in our life. That whether, that whether you continue to minister here for, for, for 15 more years or 20 more years or two more weeks, that you and I understand that we're going to continue to remind ourselves of these things. We're going to continue to press on in these things. And we're going to continue to work through these things. Because Paul, Peter says, I'm going to make every effort so that you are able to recall these things at any time after my departure. In other words, when the day comes, when, when God doesn't cause us on and we, we don't serve here in this, in this capacity in anymore, I want to be able to know wherever I'm at in this world that you know this. That you have these truths in your heart. That whatever happens in your life, when the boss does this and you want to get mad and angry, that you process back in your mind and you remember the things of Peter and you remember the things of Paul. That in your life and in your marriage, you have these things so deep inside of your heart that in my departure, when I'm no longer here, that you're able to call these things in your own life. And when you, and in your daily life with, with people in this world, you recall these things and you know these things to be true. And you know You know that I'm to add goodness, and you know that I'm to add knowledge, and you know that I'm to add endurance, and you know that I'm to be kind, and you know that I'm to love, and you know that I'm to have brotherly love. That whether I stand here and preach, or whether God calls us somewhere else, that you know these things in your heart. But beloved, even greater than that, I don't want you to stand before Jesus. (coughs) Hear me. I don't want you to stand before the Lord. I don't, want, I don't want anybody to stand before the Lord. And in that moment, and God say to you, why did you return evil for evil? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And anybody say, well, I didn't know. I had no idea. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. And then God's going to turn to me and say, why didn't you preach and teach these things? Why didn't you instruct these things? Why didn't you pour these things into the life of your people? We don't preach and teach these things because we're mean or we're cruel or anything else. We do these things because one day you're going to stand before the Lord. One day you're going to stand in that moment and God's going to look at you in the, in the stewardship of your life. And I don't want anybody to say, I didn't know that. I don't want any person to say, I wasn't aware of that. I want you in that moment to be so prepared. When Jesus says they had an opportunity to do harm, but they didn't, they chose good. And Jesus says, why? And you say, because I know the Bible says that I am to do these things. And Peter says to the church, I I know you know this stuff. (laughs) 
I, I, I know you know these things, but I'm going to make every effort to instill these things into your heart so that upon my departure, when the moment comes, that you will recall these things at any time. That's why we teach the gospel every week. That's why we teach that God is a holy and righteous God. That's why we teach that you and I have sin in our life and we've offended God. That's why we teach that the sufficiency of Jesus, that Christ is the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. That's why we teach in that you and I have a responsibility and decisions to make, and we teach on eternity, and we teach on life transformation. So that when these kids or y'all's age, they can recall the teachings of the Word.